So as Neil mentioned, um, uh, Josh uh, Reibel and I um, uh, actually were came to Dalton ap right after college. We were actually students uh, at Dalton. I was a student of Frank. Uh, uh, Frank introduced me to philosophy, which became my passion and what I studied in college. But um, he then, with Gardner, convinced us to, Josh and me, to come back uh, for what at the time was going to be a year uh, teaching and learning about education before we went on to graduate school in philosophy or whatever we wanted to do. Um, and Josh was teaching English. I was teaching history. I was teaching ninth grade history to ninth, to, I was teaching the, the, the history to ninth graders that I had studied just a few years prior as a ninth grader. Actually, a few at, weeks prior. A few, <laughs> well, actually, what, what, as Josh was my roommate, so he knows the truth was, I had forgotten all of my history, right, as, as one is wont to do after, after uh, going to uh, high school and college. So I was staying literally one chapter in front of the students, like many teachers do uh, to this very day. I'd read the chapter, I'd scramble into class and give a lecture about something that I barely <coughs> remembered or knew anything about. The, the textbook we were using had been published, uh, I think the first publication was in 1956. <laughs> uh, the, the edition we used was a third reprint. It was, you know, 15 years old. Um, and, uh, and, you know, obviously learned a tremendous amount from Frank about teaching, certainly from, from Tom. Um, but uh, I stumbled on archetype almost by accident. Um, uh, when I sort of met Neil and Mary Kate and others and went to go see what was going on uh, originally in, in the, the, uh, the first program in a, in a physical sandpit. And what struck me right away was the complete different relationship that these young kids, were they, were the little ones were how old? Eight, eight nine years old. Eight, nine years old. The relationship that these kids had with history and learning about history was completely and fundamentally different from the relationship that I had as a teacher staying one chapter ahead of my kid, or certainly that my poor students had um, learning history from uh, a teacher who was standing in front of a classroom lecturing about something he had read, you know, the, la the week before, sometimes even the night before, right? These kids were, as Neil described, they were constructing their own understanding of history by looking at the constituent pieces uh, of the past and creating their own theoretical understanding, their own hypothesis of what had happened, which is exactly what makes scholarship exciting for, as m almost all of you here obviously in this setting know, and it's exactly the opposite of how we school. We, 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 we remove all of the excitement, the, um, the detective work of scholarship, and we teach kids by lecturing at them and filling their heads, their little little uh, uh, heads with, with facts about, uh, in this case, history. It was a really important and uh, uh, sort of life-altering moment for me to understand the difference between what was going on uh, in that archaeology classroom and, and what was going on in my classroom. So um, the new lab, what's interesting is the new lab is a new lab for teaching and learning, but everyone thought it was a new lab for technology and learning. Um, and a, a really powerful, uh, probably the most powerful uh, lesson to me about technology and education was what I learned from Frank, that it's not about technology. It was about the ability to unlock um, this incredible potential of constructivist learning um, uh, using technology to bring it to scale. I mean, as Neil described, there was no way we could actually get big kids, sixth graders, to engage with um, uh, serious robust curriculum in ancient civilizations, let alone my ninth graders, uh, with the physical limitations that, um, that we had in a New York City small private school. We could do it with technology uh, in a way that uh, no one had ever really thought about or seen before. And um, so it was really Frank's belief in the potential of the learner and not in the necessarily just the potential of the technology. The te technology was secondary. Um, that, uh, that was the important story about the, the new lab. And I think at the same time, it was the understanding that the technology could unlock that potential. And I think Robbie gets a lot of credit for that. Uh, Robbie was always uh, far ahead of everyone else in terms of thinking about the potential impacts of technology on human activity. Uh, Frank often described his uh, first encounter with Robbie's first word processing uh, machine, which apparently was the size of the uh, bridge of the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> and you actually sat in a seat in the middle of the word processor. And, and, and I think that uh, after Frank got done chuckling about uh, looking at Robbie as uh, 
uh, Captain Picard in the middle of this uh, word processor that he began to see that, that this was something that had real potential uh, in the classroom as well, long before anyone else did, but long before education technology uh, became sort of uh, um, the important field that it's become. Um, the other thing I would say is that the new lab was also an, an example of Frank's outsized expectations and ambitions uh, for uh, himself, for the institutions that he was part of, for everyone around him. As uh, uh, Frank uh, uh, Gardner described uh, the new lab letterhead as a way to shake free some, some money from the, the, uh, uh, the, the education commissioner, I, I, think, I don't think I designed that first letterhead, but I'm pretty sure I designed the second letterhead and the business cards that went along with it. And Frank was able to parlay a name and a logo and some stationery into incredible, enduring relationships with some of the most important scholars, some of the most um, substantial uh, and, and interesting uh, corporate entities that were working in education technology. Um, and you know, he, it was it was it was really Frank who understood the, how technology could transform teaching and learning. Uh, and how a small private school in New York City could have an outsized impact on uh, helping to sort of uh, cross that chasm. Uh, the last thing I'd say is that um, Gardner mentioned uh, Frank's impact uh, lives on uh, in the people that he touched and the, and the work that we've gone on to do. Um, uh, I've heard the new lab once referred to as uh, the Bauhaus of education technology. And um, I think that's actually not a terrible description. Uh, when I look in this room, I've been reconnecting with old friends and colleagues, but also as I think back at the people who came through the new lab um, as employees, as staff, as teachers who worked with it, uh, many of us and many of the alumni have gone on to become leaders in uh, the education technology field and in the industry, both for nonprofit and not for profit, and not only in education technology, but also in how we use technology to transform other businesses like publishing. Today, I saw Pete Jensen, who's using it to transform uh, healthcare. Uh, so, Frank's impact on many industries uh, will probably uh, not be seen uh, by those who don't know about those relationships.